How you guys been? It's been a, been a week or so since we uh, spoke. I think the last thing we spoke about was templates, using templates. I'm hoping that was a big help to everybody. Uh, so maybe, I mean, let's start. You know, it's always good to try to do a little bit of a review on what we did. I'm not really set up today to show anything on it, but I, I could, I guess, under in a crunch uh, situation here. But uh, if anybody's got any specific questions about the template use last week, uh, by all means, pop it in here. Actually, I see one question here from, uh, looks like Christopher Dean. When using a template that includes manual delay comp, what is your, what is your show? What, I'm going to guess that's if. What if your show does not include the channel uh, with your longest delay? Uh, still wouldn't matter, honestly, because every, all the other channels are referenced to that channel. And it's just, there would be no relative offsets between the other channels then. So still not a problem uh, because you've made everything back to that longest channel. Now, if you needed to shorten your overall throughput time, then that, yeah, that might require you to, to realign uh, if you're not going to use that channel. So it's a little bit situational. But if you just, like, if you're just not using that longest channel, yeah, no problem. You can still just carry right on. All your other channels are aligned there, okay? Is that cool, Christopher? You get that, get that concept there? You can answer in the with your mic if you want, or just give me a thumbs up if you got that. Did you get the answer there? Your confirmation. Thank you very much, Robert. Oh, there we go. I was going to say your silence is your confirmation. All right. And admit just a few more people here. Okay. Um, any other questions on that? Uh, let me look here. Gear's got one. One thing I noticed that I have not done with templates is that you keep all the channels in place when you spill. What if the channels originally are on different levels? Uh, all right, so one thing to note, when you spill, regardless of what layer those channels are that are included in either that VCA or group, which we'll, we'll definitely do this today, all of those channels are gonna come to the top. It's almost, almost like that spill is a filter and just says anything that is assigned to that master that you're spilling, bring it to the top layer, all right? So it doesn't have to be there. So in terms of the, uh, is keeping all the channels, let's see, let me read it again, is that you keep all the channels in place when you spill. I, I don't keep all the channels in place, just strategic ones, gear. So like uh, even on the show file I'll show you today, I have some VCAs and some audio subgroups kind of safed, bank safed into place, and I just spill around that. So once I spill, then those, those in inputs become visible without losing sight of the key inputs that I need to mix the show. So I hope that answers your question there. Any other? Uh, oh boy. It does. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. yep. Awesome. All right. So I'll take uh, just a couple more questions in the chat if you got them. And if not, then we'll kind of move on to groups and VCAs and blah, blah, blah. Mute your mics if you haven't. Otherwise, I will. All right. Okay. Well, you know, today really I, I kind of changed uh, t my tack midstream before this, uh, before this lab, I, and it really all had to do with I, I recently released an article for uh, Live Sound International, uh, talking about my use of groups and spilling and all kinds of things like that in order to manage a really big show, which I think we've used that show file, funny enough, in the lab here a couple of times. But uh, it was kind of an article on. Uh, you know how we do that sort of thing, or how I, you know how I made that really work to my advantage on a really really big show. So, what, I, ironically, once the article came out, I had a week away from the lab, and I received just a ton of emails saying, "Hey, let's please cover that in the lab. Let's go go through that and kind of dig in." So, I, it, this kind of superseded where we're going to end up, uh, where I was planning on going, uh, but I just thought we would do that anyway. Okay, so uh, I've got one session up here now. Uh, we could pull up the big session if we need to really drive home the point, but I think we'll probably get through it in this one session here. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's kind of get going here. So um, maybe the best way to do this uh, to save some time here uh, is just let me let me do a little straw poll here for a second, just kind of see where your heads are at here. How many of you guys? Uh, Let's just do it as a, just raise your hand in the hand raising mechanism. I'll just get a, a sense of it in terms of percentage. 
Uh, let me ask this question first. How many of you guys are front of house mixers? How many front of house mixers we got in? Nice. Keep them coming there. Probably should ask how many monitor mixers we got in here. So we're actually going to cover some of that today. Yeah, okay, nice. You can uh, let your hands down now, okay? And how many of you guys, you know, when you're setting up your mixes, uh, lean on lean on audio subgroups as opposed to VCAs? Let's, let's, let's take that one first. Audio subgroups. How many of you use them? And you're using them as submasters, right? To get to the master. Boy, that's really encouraging. I can tell you, I, you know, I've been on a little bit of a crusade with this for many years, and I can tell you a few years ago, not that many people would have raised their hand right there. That's really encouraging. All right? Because, you know, uh, this discussion, okay, you guys can drop your hands there. Thank you. Uh, this discussion always seems to gravitate, um, I want to say this, toward kind of a binary thing where, you know, people want to make it, well, do you use VCAs or groups? It's like, that's, that's not a binary question for me at all. I use both all the time. Uh, I, you know, to try to use one without using the other, boy, it just feels uh, like you're really selling yourself short or cutting yourself short there. So just to kind of recap uh, my take on it, and hopefully it'll drive some discussion here as we go on. Uh, and I, I've, I've been doing it this way for just so many years. Even all the way back to my early analog days, I was kind of taught to do it this way. And it's just carried on with me through... Uh, through digital is that you know I as in the context of mixing music now we're gonna we're gonna put that context on all of this today in terms of mixing music I don't have any inputs that go directly to the left right bus everything goes through an audio submaster in order to get to the left right bus and I divide that up into families of instruments right all of the drums and its processing would be one family of instruments uh, you can make it all of the electric guitars is one family of instruments I, I usually separate out uh, acoustic guitars and electric guitars, uh, just because they kind of sit in different places in the mix sometimes, and, and level-wise they can be uh, a little trickier. So sometimes I'll have an all-acoustics guitar subgroup, uh, all keyboards, all backing vocals, all lead vocals, and all of them are there uh, with with their processing. You know, Hang on, I'm gonna mute some noisy people here. Uh, so. You know, the goal of that is to uh, be able to keep your gain structure in play. I, um, you know, I've kind of shown this before, and I'll show it again here today. You know, when I get my audio submaster set up, and where it, to me where it kind of sounds balanced like music, there's often as much as 10 or 15 dB of difference in level between, like, the drums and bass submaster and the vocal submasters. And if that if that offset isn't put in there using subgroups to do this, submasters to do this, it's got to happen somewhere, right? And in the past, historically, where I've seen people gravitate to make that change is at the input gain, right? It's, not, it's just not really the best place to do it. You can certainly do it. It's not going to, you know, it's not a showstopper by any stretch. But if you're being a good kind of, uh, a, a good audio guy, that's not the most optimized place to do it, as we've, as we've kind of talked about or I've talked about in gain structure demonstrations and stuff before as well. So. So maybe let's get through, I'll take you through a little bit of this presentation, just kind of drive home some of these points. We won't make this a PowerPoint fest. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through it and then get you kind of going on some of these other things. So these are some of the grouping concepts that we're going to talk about. And as you can see, i got navigation concepts in here as well. Uh, and I think it, it is as important of a part of this as managing your console, managing your audio through the console as anything. Because what these submasters, whether you're using them in VCA or groups or whatever, what they become is a navigation point for you, right? Not near as important if we're in analog, where everything is on the top layer and everything is sitting in front of us. But if you're talking about a show that's, you know, 150, 200 inputs deep, and you're mixing it on 24, 32 faders, your ability to navigate on that console is central to your success in the show, right? So the groups and the spill function in particular give you a way to navigate to all of those inputs and, and address them really, really quickly because let's face it, right? I mean, if you can't, it, it's great to have all these inputs and outputs. If you can't get to them quickly, 
in the context of a live show, they serve you no purpose, right? You've got to be able to get to them quickly to, to manipulate them and mix with them. So uh, it's, it's got to happen that way. So navigation is as big a piece of the puzzle as any here. And, I, and honestly, I, I would say to you, in the first generation of digital consoles, I think that's where the struggle really was, was just being able to elegantly navigate a lot of inputs and outputs. You know, none of us really had it really right yet uh, to any stretch of the imagination. But we sure learned an awful lot of lessons in that first generation of consoles. And I, and I say that for all manufacturers, not just, not just Avid here. So the last thing we'll talk about, if there's time, if there's time, if not, we'll just pick it up at the next, uh, at the next lab, is this concept of building monitor comm buses. And, and there's a lot of monitor grouping strategies you can put in place as well. Uh, but I also, I just thought, you know, that's a good place to talk about this as well, is talk about uh, building a monitor bus that can include comms mics and really cool ways to do that that are really effective. So. Uh, we'll talk about that because it uses a lot of these grouping strategies to be able to do it. Okay, that sound good to everybody? Fred is here. I, I will not start talking until Fred is in the room. That's how it's going to work. All right, so let's take a look here. Uh, so using audio submaster. So this is kind of what I'm going to show you today. This, th these, uh, this Prezo was kind of built upon the show file I'm going to show you today. And like I said, you know, all of, the, uh, all of my family of instruments uh, are in audio submasters. And I want to reiterate just again, you know, that includes all processing, et cetera. The idea, it's kind of a stem building mentality, right, where you want to build a complete drum mix and then just have a master volume for it. That's the idea with this audio submaster, right? Uh, so I do that all, for all the different families. Even, even if it's just, honestly, if it's just base DI, I still do it. It allows me to keep my uh, input gain at the right places on my base DI and then reset the volume of it in the PA system, all right? So... Even though I, in this situation, you can see I probably got just one or two inputs assigned to the bass guitar, I would still have a submaster for it. And, and there's other reasons for that, as you'll see going forward here. Okay. Uh, one more here. All right, so it, the idea here is with audio submasters, if uh, we keep our families of instruments together here, let's see if I can get it together here to do this, uh, we, can, uh, we can have faders that are just master volumes for those families, right, where we can blend something into something that sounds like music very, very quickly once those are built and, uh, and then being able to navigate back to them to do edits and adjustments on it, okay? So the idea there is just to have uh, a master volume including your drum or including your processing. So maybe we'll start there. I'll just stop there and we'll show you, give you an example of that. I got to get some cameras turned on here for a second. I forgot to do this. Stand by. There they come. All right, so you know, in my I, this would be very characteristic of my show file that I would normally, or, well, certainly of my template, and then it would expand or contract kind of depending on the show. So, uh, in this particular show file, you can see right here, this is my audio submaster set, right? And it's not far off of what you saw in the drawing, right? Which is this is my drum submaster. Uh, bass, uh, all the guitar, electric guitar. Actually, I, I combined electric guitar and acoustic guitars on this particular show file. Uh, keyboards, backing vocals, and lead vocals, right? Uh, so that is the audio submasters. The entire input set for the show travels through that set of audio submasters. And then within that, I've got VCAs that are operating with inside, you know, or inside those groups uh, for key elements of it, which we'll get to here in just a second. But as you can see, you know, here I, I'm on a 48 fader console. I got a lot of faders here, but still, I don't have access to any of the drum channels right now, right? If I want to get to them, then I've got to tunnel down. I've got to actually spill to get to it, right? So I would spill this, and here are my drum channels starting to come up here uh, that I can get to, all right? So uh, just making adjustments and going back out of that, all right? So. That is how that kind of that, that is the idea there. And again, the idea is to keep uh, your gain, your input gain high, and keep your input faders in a high resolution portion of their throw, right? So you can make uh, you know small adjustments, small meaningful adjustments on it. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to stop there for a question. And Christopher, is it? Yeah, Christopher Dean, go. Got a question there? Um, do you use all stereo or a combination of mono and stereo subgroups? Uh, I, I'm almost always stereo. I, the only one I change sometimes is the bass guitar subgroup. If it's if it's all mono, low frequency stuff, then sure, I'll just save a group and and make it mono. Yeah. That answer your question there. Want to follow up on that at all or anything? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean it's so it's so beautiful because it's so nice and easy now to make, you know, mono or stereo subgroups. It's it's just it's a piece of cake to do it. No penalty. Sully, welcome in, man. Good to hear from you. What's up? Sully, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? I see your hand up. I see your mic open. But I am not hearing you. House lights are out. We don't have the lead vocal. Everybody stop. Brother, I'll come back to you. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh. Why is it so loud? Yeah, just turn yourself way, way down there. Wait. Why is it so loud? I don't know. Why is it so <laughs> Way down, way down. I kind of see you on your meters there. Does that sound more normal now? Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a little better. That's a little better. Um, spill safing. Do you? I know you're on a 48 fader surface now, but if you're on 32, would you spill safe your group so that they're still available to you to to make adjustments while you're spilling your drum kit, or how do you go about that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't necessarily have those safed. Uh, you know, I don't mind losing sight of them because usually with my subgroups, my submasters like to say they're they're a submaster to the left, right. It's just a volume setting for it. And I, I'm not mixing here per se. Let me uh, get this back up here. So I'm, I'm rarely ever mixing here. You know, these are just master volumes. So if I lose sight of them, I, I really don't care. So is there anything uh, like your lead vocal or your VCAs? Do you spill safe that stuff? VCAs, I definitely spill safe. Right? Or I, I call it bank safe, right? which is the right term here. So, but yeah, I'll bank safe these because I'm going to be mixing here for sure. I mean, this is solos. This is you know, keyboard rides, whatever it's going to be. So there's a lot of activity that goes on here. So yeah, I'll, I'll like part of my layouts will almost always have the audio subgroups here. Uh, but as soon as I spill it, as you can see, it goes away, right? My VCAs stay. These go, this is now my drum inputs. Yeah. Follow me there. Copy. Yeah. And then thanks. I just, then just cancel out of it and you're right back where you are. My, my the, the auto subgroups and the VCAs are almost always almost always a kind of a bedrock of my layout like that's honestly the first place I start with a layout and then I'll start building in around it you know like when I did the the petty thing I mean that was on a 16 C 16 faders so obviously I, you know I don't have room to keep up you know eight you know ten audio subgroups in uh, in that situation I've got to have access to some inputs that was really a lot of that show was really driven by a VCA assignments for players you know that was what that was all about which we'll, we'll talk about here going forward that makes sense to you. Somebody, yeah, uh, actually, yes, thanks. somebody else had a hand up there as well. Did you want to come back on it? No. Okay. Oh, there we go. Mike Shapiro, go ahead, man. Sorry, I think you just touched on it, Robert. I was going to ask if you were using your VCAs per player, and I think you're going to go there. So I will. I lower my hand <laughs> that's all right yeah I am we'll definitely talk about that right okay so you know audio submasters like I say it's kind of it's kind of the secret formula I hate to say it and you know the weird thing was we kind of when we got to digital it seemed like the manufacturers were kind of moving away from them you know they were just thinking well, nobody uses audio subgroups anymore and it, you know there was this weird kind of time I you know I, I remember this in the you know in the early 80s you know through probably the early 90s you know there was kind of this mentality that was these good kind of existing in analog you know where it was like oh no we don't want to use submasters you don't want to go through any summing amps you want to you know you want to keep the signal as clean as you can to the left right bus all these kind of things you know and, and honestly I think it it probably helped drive the development of the VCA you know certainly a lot by SSL etc they were this kind of mentality was in play 
but I I never bought into it for live. You know, for live, I, I there are things I've got to do that with those audio subgroups that are helping me out in terms of gain structure. You know, in the studio, it's not as big a deal. I mean, I can print as hot as I want and then turn it down on the returns. I mean, it's easy to get that gain structure really, uh, really done easily on the, in the studio. But in live, where we're, we're kind of tracking and mixing at the same time, it's a much more, much more difficult thing to, to pull off, you know. So, like I said, I, I've been on it <laughs> since, since very early analog. And, you know, like I said, that whole mentality was there saying, don't go through summing amps. Don't go through summing amps. And what are we doing today? Everybody's buying summing amps and putting them in their digital consoles, you know. So it's, it's kind of crazy. All right, so let's see. Where do we go from there? Let's see. So, yeah, spilling audio submasters. We kind of talked about that here. So, so yeah, uh, I think somebody asked this question earlier, so this will help uh, uh, answer this. The question was asked, well, what is the difference between uh, a VCA and an audio subgroup? And this is part of the discussion right here. And with an audio subgroup, the audio actually passes through the group, right? It actually transports through that master to get to your left, right master. So given that it does that, obviously you can do lots of things with it. You can actually process the group of inputs as a group, meaning you can put compression, EQ on it as a composite uh, and do that. And that can be very powerful in certain settings for sure. So uh, uh, that's certainly one of the big advantages to doing uh, audio subgroups there. Best part of it is you can uh, review your, the relative balances of that drum mix, you know, that we're working on, whatever. You know, you pull it up in headphones and listen to that drum mix, and it sounds out of balance there. It's going to be out of balance when it comes out of the PA, fellas. That, you know, that's just the truth of it. May not, we may not want to admit it, but uh, that's the deal. You want a Robertism? I'll give you a Robertism. No PA system ever, ever took a bad mix and made it sound better than a better mix. You know, it just... That's not how it works, you know. You might get fooled by it a little bit sometimes, but that's not the case. The more balanced in, in terms of frequency and levels at that group level, the better it's going to sound coming out of the PA, period, end of story. I'll fight you on that one all day if you want. Okay, so um, other important aspect of audio subgroups versus VCAs is that I can change uh, an audio subgroup Now, I can change the level of an audio submaster, right? Oops, sorry. Ah. <laughs> I'll get it right here one of these times. There we go. I can change the level of this audio submaster, right? And there's absolutely zero impact on the input faders and their levels, their own levels, as well as the levels going up into the bus, right? That is not the case for a VCA. If I had all of these inputs assigned to a VCA, then I'm actually affecting the fader levels at the input side as well as any post fader levels uh, that are going on in the aux buses. So that's that's really the main main difference there for sure. Uh, so and of course, as it says there, spill is the way to give us some uh, some navigation capability there. Super important in digital console. All right, let me check the chat here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Blah blah blah. blah, 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 blah. And if you're wearing headphones, how fast did you turn down your volume? <laughs> I'm assuming that was aimed at Sully. <laughs> I know my ears about came poking out, poking out of my head. So, all right, let's talk about VCA grouping here. Uh, VCA grouping. So, in this situation, this is always the best way I like to describe my approach to this. And guys, I just want to make—I'll give you the disclaimer now. I'm not saying you have to do this this way. I really am not. I'm just saying this is how I do it. Choose to use it, choose to use your own, whatever you want to do, but this has served me really, really well over time, uh, mixing live sound. So just take this for what it's worth, okay? When I think of VCA grouping, my, my strategy for VCA grouping is I think player, right? I want to have control of the player, the player on one fader. So, uh, or, you know, some key element of what he's doing maybe on one fader. But in, in total, I'm thinking player there. And the example I always give because I worked with one of these guitar players. I know Dave Morgan is in the house. He worked with the same guitar player and understands this. You know, for a guitar player, he might play electric guitar. No mites, he's gonna play electric guitar. He might play acoustic. He might play banjo. He might play harpsichord. He might play tambourine. He might walk over to a keyboard that's sitting next to him and play that as well. Well, all of those inputs, in terms of families, are gonna go through different audio submasters. If he's playing percussion or tambourine, whatever, that's going to be included in the drum kit, 
with me. That's, that's where the blend matters to me. If he's playing electric guitars, whatever, those are going to go through the electric guitar audio submaster. If he's playing a keyboard part, it's going to be included with the keyboards in their audio submaster. But all of those inputs for me are going to be attached to one VCA labeled him, right? And it's probably going to sit on the top layer and never leave there the whole night because I know no matter what he's playing, his volume is right on that fader, right? I have, it, I have him there. He can't play all the instruments at the same time. As long as I make sure the right ones are muted, I'm off to the races. I'll never lose sight of him. And then on top of it, if I need to get to something, maybe he, he walks over and picks up another instrument that I wasn't expecting, then I just spill that VCA, get right to it, turn it on, do whatever I need to do to it, spill back out of it, and now I'm right back to controlling him, right? So the idea is that, you know, he is sitting here, you know, on one fader. That's the idea with these VCAs. Uh, so, you know, I don't necessarily use VCAs as that submaster where I'm setting a volume in the PA with them. I, I, I you know, I can, I can make the argument for you that I don't think that's the great, greatest use of VCAs in that situation. I would much rather have them, you know, in control of inputs. You know, I, I don't really want to sit with these stagnant here and have them be VCAs. You know, it's not really serving me much to do that. Matter of fact, you know, VCAs sitting down in here are in the low res portion of the throw. You know, you're not going to be able to really mix on them there really effectively. You can still do it, but not really effectively. Okay? So player, that's what I'm thinking there. All right, so let's talk about that in this context here. So as you can kind of see here on my example in the PowerPoint, I've got, you know, a set of VCA masters that are sitting at unity gain, right? And why, do, why are they sitting at unity gain? Because what that means is there's no offset being caused by them at the input side, right? The input faders are where they are sitting if that VCA is sitting at unity gain. Also, at unity gain, that's the highest resolution portion of the fader throw. So even if I've got faders all over the place in terms of level, if I want to add a half a dB to everything that is assigned to that VCA, I can very, very easily do that when it's sitting around unity gain. You can do that very elegantly around unity gain, all right? So the idea is I make a move with the VCA, and then it goes right back to unity gain, and my mix goes right back to where it was. So it allows me to, to make moves with these particular things. So let's take a look at how that might work here. So in this situation, though, you can kind of notice uh, I've only got a few of the drum inputs assigned to a VCA here, right? Maybe, it, and, and this, I, I got something similar to this on the console right now, but the idea is correct. So maybe I take kick, snare, toms, overhead, hi-hat, and I assign those to the VCA. Well, why am I only assigning those? Because I, I want to be able to move those things independently for maybe an intro or a breakdown or something like that. Well, what happens post-fader? If you've got post-fader compression, you know, in your spank group or whatever, well, in my mind, that's okay in that situation, right? Maybe, matter of fact, as I turn that VC up, it's going to drive the compression a little harder. It's going to get a little crunchier or whatever it's going to be, get a little more exciting when I turn it up. But the most important part is when I'm done with that move, that fader goes back to unity and my drum mix is right back where it was, including the threshold on uh, the parallel compression, all of that. All of it just goes right back to where it was if it's in unity, okay? So I got to let somebody else in here. Okay, you with me there? Right, so uh, let's take a look at another example here. So here's, you notice I got three keyboard VCAs here, right? And I, this was, I, I used this specifically on Petty. This was exactly how I did this on Petty, so that I could manage all of Benmont's keys really well. And that is, you know, assigning one VCA to the piano. In the, in the instance of Benmont Tench, that was four piano mics, uh, you know, some help and steel that was used for some other elements of, you know, the sound, etc. So just being able to have that on one fader was really helpful. Also having the organ, both the top mics and the bottom mic on one fader. And then all the rest of his keyboards, whether it's Wurlitzer, Strings, DX7, whatever, sat on another VCA. And then that, that allowed me at any point to just completely reblend or feature any one of his keyboards that he would be playing at a given time. Same sort of thing. I, I, I say this carefully. He couldn't play all of them at the same time. Actually, he could. But 
uh, you know, it allowed you to to blend them every now and then uh, differently. Like one night he might take the solo on the piano, the next he might take it on the organ. So if you had the VCAs uh, handy to you, you could be you could jump right on that and catch it really really quickly, right? So uh, it allowed me to readdress that blend. All right, so here take a look at the guitars here. So the guitars are in turquoise. Notice all the inputs are muted sans one. Maybe this is an acoustic that he's going to be playing here, but. That one fader is in charge of that. And then for the next move, notice that the percussion up in the top is assigned to that VCA. It's in the drum group uh, family, but yet I'm still controlling it with the same VCA. You know, if it's a tambourine, he's probably taking two hands to play it. Not going to be playing any guitar during that. I can write it up as needed, okay? So thinking player there, player. And then, of course, uh, our spill works really effectively here as well, right? If we're going to we're going to spill the VCA, well, then it's going to collate those inputs right to the top layer and allow us to work on them. If you had stuff safe, the stuff that's safe is going to stay there. You work on your drums and then get back out of that spill and you're right back where you were, right? So, you know, this whole idea of, you know, I, I never, at least for me, I, I'm never hitting inputs buttons or input layers or anything. My entire navigation process emanates from either the audio subgroup spills or the VCA spills for the night. I can get anywhere I need to go because all of my inputs go through that process to get to the output, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Daryl Carter is in the house. Okay, let me take a look at some chat here and see how, we got, how we're doing here. Would you have a separate VCA for a player's instrument versus vocal? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. In that situation, I would, most definitely. Uh, let's see, what do we, uh, that's pretty interesting. This is from uh, Mr. Komsky. I'm sorry, I'm going to blow your name here. I mix a seven-piece band. A few of them play keys and guitar and a bone. I haven't changed my VCA layout in a while. This is worth a try. Nice, yes. And boy, in a big band situation like that where you got people swapping instruments all over the time, this is a real, real savior workflow for that. That will keep your head in the, in the mix better than it, probably anything you can do here. Uh, let's see, are you doing your balance on the audio subgroups since you're not using the VCAs? Uh, when you say balance, I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, uh, sorry, Komsky, I got it there, nickname, got it. Uh, when you say balance there, it, uh, it's just overall balance. So let's go back here. So remember, these are, these are stem volumes, right? This is the, the level of the entire drum kit, the entire bass rig, the guitars, the keyboards, the backing vocals, the lead vocals. So yes, this is a balance that's going to make it sound like music. Matter of fact, I'm going to play it for you here just in a second. And then inside that, there are other balances, obviously. There's a balance of bass drum to snare drum to hi-hat to tom-toms to overheads, right? And if I need to get to that, it's a matter of spilling to get to, to those and rebalance them or re-equalize them, okay? So yes, uh, that's the overall, overall volumes and balances, right? So let's maybe take a look at this for a second. Let me... Uh, Let's see how this goes here. My stream down. Let me just test this. I can, I've been kind of messing with this, with other stuff all morning. I probably got this all screwed up here. Stand by one second. Right, so um, as you can kind of see here, uh, this is the drum kit, bass guitar, guitars, acoustic guitar, that's what he's playing on that particular one, and some keyboards. And obviously in this situation I can change the level of the piano to Leslie, and the vocal obviously. So. So if we're going to blend it up here. Right, so just in terms of stem mixing, you can make that, you know, hopefully sound like music very quickly. I, for my money, this is my secret weapon at festivals. I've done, through the 80s and 90s, I did more festivals 
taking advantage of that subgroup workflow to be able, you know, where there's no line check or no sound check, I should say, you're going to get a line check, but just build in that drum mix in the uh, in the subgroup and then turn it on when the show starts, you know. Might be worth, you know, just examining that drum group just to reinforce this. Let me do this. So, uh, let's meet this out for a second. Oops, sorry. So I'm just going to give you the drums for a second. So just to kind of reinforce this here, if we explode this out, so what I've got here is, I'll just read them off to you because it's going to be hard for you to read it here. Hi-hat, overhead, uh, some other mics, cowbells and ride cymbals that are muted on this particular song, another set of overheads. Uh, this is the drums submaster still. It's stayed in place. Here is my kick snare toms bridge and my kick snare toms that is parallel compressed. These are my room and plate, right? This is all in here so we can make these relative balances here. This is a, 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 another parallel path that I use for the snare drum. But the question will be, well, how do you get maybe how do you get to your kick snare and toms if you're doing this parallel uh, compression thing? And I've got it set up where I can actually spill the aux that is feeding this off of one of these chicken buttons, right? So if I, if I spill that, now these are the things that are feeding the compression, right? And I can cancel back out of that and get to my regular drum kit. So, you know, those instrument, those inputs, just for the record too, let's take a look at this, just to show you this. If we go back uh, here, yeah, let's do this. So it's worth noting go to overview that all of the like when I spill that drum group what is showing up there is all of the stuff that is let me annotate it here make it even more we'll make the presentation pop as they say so when I spill what you're actually getting is this and this right that is coming to the top layer because I, I like to keep all of my parallel returns at the very bottom of the inputs in the console. It makes it where I can get to it very easily in the universe view on S6L and I, I never have to search for a parallel path. I always know it's at the bottom end of the console. But when I spill it, it recollates those things back to the top layer, right? So all my drum inputs, all the drum processing, drum parallel paths, meaning, uh, you know, spanks, uh, goos, whatever we're using there, all the effects returns all come up there as well, right? Is that making sense to you guys? All right, so um, let me get back to camera for a second. Let's go here. Go here. Definitely trackball challenged. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things I ha also have is that, you know, kick, snare, toms, kind of overhead thing to be able to do a drum push, you know, and push it into compression and, and make it a little fatter and bigger as you turn it up. And I've got that on a VCA, right? So uh, that VCA is down here right now. I set it up here just because I didn't, didn't have it built into this layout. But if I were to spill that, Right, what comes up are the things that are assigned to that VCA, right? Which is a lot of the drum kit. Uh, if we were to look here, oops, let's go here and go here. Oh. <laughs> I'll get there. Just hang in there with me. There we go. That 
that's what I was trying to do. So as I move that fader, you can see that the drum inputs are actually moving there. If you look down to the lower left-hand corner, you can see that VCA is actually affecting those faders. So, you know, when I push this up, obviously, it's going to drive harder into the, uh, into the parallel compression, et cetera. Anything that's post-bus, it's going to drive harder into my effects processing, et cetera. It's going to change the drum sound, uh, but it's ho only going to be there for a second, right? So, or as long as I need it for the breakdown or whatever it's going to be there. Okay. All right, let's go back here. Oh man, I'm flying on this thing now. Look out. All right. Okay, any questions there? I, I you know, I know this gets a little tricky for people here, so Christopher Dean, on, in answer to your question, yes, this is a 48D that I'm sitting in front of, but I usually work on a 32D. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so obviously if we spill, we see that come collate just like I showed you there on the actual console. And in terms of VCA gr kind of grouping strategy, the idea is that, you know, it's perfect for player control. That's, that's the way I work with it, certainly. Uh, you've got to be careful with it a little bit, though. Because it can provide, you know, really quick kind of post fader blend assessment, but you got to know how your console actually solos, right? Uh, because if it if it's a destructive solo in BCA, it'll it'll give you those levels by muting everything else on the console. So be careful. Not very many consoles do it anymore, but some of the early consoles uh, 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 did do that. Obviously, it can also work as a mute group, uh, where when you mute the VCA, it's actually muting it at the fader level, so anything post aux is not going to be heard by it, et cetera. So it can work as a mute group as well. Uh, but it's also worked uh, really well for me for a lot of other things, which are being in control of PA matrices, you know, all kinds of other things, which is what we're going to talk about next here. Right? So combining audio submasters and VCAs. So uh, again, this is kind of based on my workflows. Again, you can do this as you see fit. It really, for me, it, this was all kind of driven by getting quick access and really quick control. So uh, take a look at this here. So here you've got audio submasters and VCA masters in play. All right. So you can see that the drum kit, all the inputs in green, are assigned to a VCA master that sets an overall volume uh, for the drums in the PA system. Right. But inside that group is also a VCA that's in control of, in this example, uh, kick, snare, hat, and overhead, right? That's going to be probably used for some, some feature uh, in what it's doing, okay? So in that situation, right, if we spill the audio subgroup, like I said, it's going to bring up those uh, inputs and allow you to work on them. Uh, if I spill the VCA, it's going to recollate it to just the inputs that are assigned to that VCA within that audio submaster, okay? And then, same sort of thing here. Here's where it starts to get really cool with VCA, because VCA doesn't have to be assigned to an input, right? It can be in control of any fader on the console. So in this situation, and I've, I've done this in the past, I'm not currently doing it right now, but I have done this in the past. I've taken all of my uh, audio submasters, right? Not vocal submasters, just the audio submasters, and assigned them to a VCA, right? Then I have the volume of the music inside my mix bus, on a single fader right? in high resolution. That thing is sitting right in the highest resolution portion of this throw. So I can make very subtle changes in just the volume of the band without impacting anything on the input side. Just strictly the volume of the band, right? So here is my VCA that is in charge of my audio submasters. And of course, what happens if I spill that VCA? the audio submasters come right to the top. So I don't even really have to have them on the top layer uh, if I don't want to do that. I can have them at the, at the push of a button if I need to get it. And then on top of that, if I need to spill again, I can go to any one of those audio submasters and spill it, and it comes to the top layer now. So through two button sequences, I can work from being in complete control of my music to getting all the way down to the input level with inside the drum kit. Sully's got a question. Bring it on, man. I promise my mic will be the, the right level this time. <laughs> um, talk to us about your thoughts on why you submaster or VCA all your subgroups as opposed to 
all your band inputs. Like, what's the, the real difference for you on that being the submasters or the inputs, VC? The real difference there is that I can make this move that I'm talking about right here. Let me back it up. Yeah, right here. So I mean, besides the pushing stuff into effects and that kind of stuff would be the main reason, right? Yeah, that's the uh, that for me that is the reason almost in total where you know I'm just taking the blend that exists at the audio submasters and making it louder. You know, I'm just riding the band up without any consequence to the input side at all. Right now, could I do that inside of the audio submaster as well with another VCA? Sure, I, we could do that. It's just you know pick your poison there, but I, I you know I like what you're going to see here in a second. I and I used to do this this way and, and then changed to doing this with matrices. But I always loved having a VCA that was in charge of my music audio submasters and another VCA that was in charge of my vocal submasters. Right? And by doing this, I could literally just pull the vocals out of the band mix and at any time feature the band and then put it right back where it was you know, and, and without any impact on gain structure. Because remember, if you were to do this at the input side, now you're driving those inputs harder into the group, and the group is now driving harder into the left right, right? So you're probably going to run out of an amount that you can do that at some point, and you you probably got enough headroom built into the audio submasters to the to the master bus to be able to control them as one and push them up or down. You know? So uh, that's my reason. Hope that reads for everybody there. Makes sense. So let's carry on in our little, our little cute little PowerPoint here. So here, as I kind of mentioned here, I, and I, you know, I'm surprised how many guys have not glommed onto this, although it's much more popular now in digital consoles than it was in analog, where you have a left-right driving your PA system, and you have an auxiliary driving your subwoofers. And at some point in the show, you turn your PA system down only to realize the subwoofers are not coming down with it. It's still really loud, right? Yeah, I'm, how, I won't even ask to raise your hands how many time guys have done that. We've all done that in our lives. Well, you know, VCA is the answer to that, right? I, just assign a VCA to your left-right master and, a, and the same VCA assigned to your aux master that's driving your subs, and that blend will stay intact now as you turn down your, that, that VCA, right? So remember, it's just a remote control for faders, nothing more, nothing less, really, and that'll allow you to keep those things, in, you know, keep your blend there right. Now you can kind of treat that if you want, you know, not to go down the rabbit hole here, but kind of treat that like a loudness button on, the, on your uh, on your stereo as well. You know, when you turn it down, do we, do we add more subwoofer or whatever you want to do? You know, you can do all kinds of stuff with that if you want to do it. All right, let's carry on. Oh, and of course, let's talk about the spill from that aspect as well, right? So if I have that fader sitting on the top layer, I don't even have to have my master fader sitting at the top layer, right? Or, my, or the auxiliary. I just spill that VCA, and what comes up? The aux master and the left-right master. Now, you, the difference here is that you can't spill a left-right master. You know, unfortunately, you can't do it. I, I really wish we could do it because it would make a lot of sense in this workflow but they don't allow you to do it. But you can spill the aux. So once the aux is visible to you on the top layer, spill the aux, and now everything that is in that aux is right in front of you. Kick, snare, keyboards, bass, whatever it's going to be. And if you include that in a sends on fader workflow, which we'll kind of talk about here, now it's those faders actually represent the actual aux levels. right? So if you did a sends on fader plus spill there, now you're, you're right down to the source going to the subs there. So again, very quick here. You know, you're not going through layers and things like that. It just works so great to be able to work with these spill combinations to get to where you need to go. Okay. Let's look at another. Let's see what do we got now. Oh, this. So here's your matrix one, right? So, and, and I've been doing this for a long time now, and I, I don't think I'll ever work any other way now. So I, I take at least one VCA, especially on S6L where I can have it up on the top layer all the time. I take one VCA and I assign it to all of my matrix drives for the PA, all of them. So main left right, down fill, aux PA, front fill, all of those are driven by their own matrices that is in control, being controlled by one VCA. And what that does, it, very similar to you know, kind of controlling those groups, this gives me a grandmaster volume for the PA system, for the PA system, that impacts nothing below it. From the left-right bus all the way down to the bottom, 
is not impacted by a move with that. I literally just have the volume of the PA system sitting on a fader, right? It works absolutely fa fantastic. I, I just call it my PA Grandmaster, you know. And of course, you get the spill opportunity there as well, right? So if I spill that VCA, the matrix has come up to the top layer now. I don't have to navigate to them or find them or disrupt my mixing workflow. I just spill that VCA, up they come, and then if I want to get into those VCAs and adjust the, uh, the, the sources in it, I just spill a VCA, right? Oops. Spill a VCA, and now those sources are on the top layer, you know, the things that are being added together in that VCA. I can get through them and make adjustments on it really, really quickly and then get right back out of it, right? So they're really, really powerful, really powerful to do this. Let's take a pause there for a second. I'll let you chew on that before we move on to the next little section here. And we probably won't get all the way through this today. Is that making sense to everybody? As you listen to me crunch ice in your headphones? I'm just kind of reading through some of the chats here. Yeah, good, making sense. Yeah, nice. So somebody asked here, so the VCAs are assigned to the subgroup masters at, and not the input channels. Well, it's, it's both. It's both, right? I just have one VCA that's dedicated to the music subgroups there, which is just a master volume for those subgroups. It's the same, same concept as having a PA grandmaster. There you just have a music grandmaster. And I'll, I'll just I'll say this. Once you get used to mixing with that, <coughs> where you can make you know, just one dB moves on your music, the volume of your music for a given song or whatever it's going to be, it's intoxicating. It is really, really intoxicating. <coughs> because it's easy to get the, make the music really loud and then get it right back to where it was supposed to be. Mm, sorry, one second. I know it was kind of a secret weapon on Petty <clears throat> where I could, I always have my master volumes sitting right next to my vocal and it's just these little bitty rides all night just to keep, re I call it kind of revealing the vocal instead of trying to push the vocal up above it. Just pull the music back just a little bit to, to kind of reveal the vocal. It works really, really good. Sean, go. I was going <clears> to <throat> say it's a quick, easy way to, you know, if you're getting into feedback trouble, you just pull your band down one, two dB and you can... You know, make some space for the vocal and not have yeah. to worry about it. And the balance stays the same. And, you know, if you got a singer in front of the PA or whatever, or runs in front of the speaker cluster, whatever, you can get the band out of your way real quick. You sure can. Yeah. It's it, like I said, it becomes kind of intoxicating once you start doing it. You start realizing how powerful just that little bit of dynamic move is in it, you know. All right. So let's talk about uh, another little thing that we can do if we, if we subscribe to the submaster concept, it gives you the ability to do some other kind of cool things using matrices, right? And that is building what I call offset mixes. And this is going to probably become, as we kind of get back in the world of mix and live sound and maybe start doing some streaming as well, this, kind, this concept actually becomes kind of important, uh, especially if you're working in smaller venues. So uh, the idea is this, is that we're actually going to take a matrix and rebuild the subgroup mix there, right? So that if, let's, let's say, heaven forbid, we're in an environment where the guitar is too loud. I know, I know it's crazy talk. It's crazy talk. It could happen. Where the guitar is too loud, so really what we might end up sending out to the stream would end up essentially being mix minus, right? Would be mix minus the guitars. Or at least the guitar level might end up being way down in the stream mix. Well, using kind of audio submasters here, we can very, very easily and quickly offset that level to the stream, right? So it kind of goes like this. Check this out. So if you take your uh, and add your submasters to a matrix, not your left, right, and this is for the stream or maybe even for recording. I mean, you could do this to the PA if you want to, but I, I don't think I would do it in that situation. It, it starts to get uh, hard to manage at some point. But if you add your submasters here, then obviously uh, you can rebuild your what is feeding your left-right bus. You're basically still building a second left-right bus by doing this, right? And if these go up post-fader, they're following your levels 
uh, that you're setting on the console. We don't. I don't think we really give you a pre-fade option to get those there. Actually, I should check that. I don't remember seeing that, but it might be true. I'm going to check it before I say it here. Do 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 do. Let's just have a look here. Yeah, so you do have the ability to go pre fader, pre mute, or post fader into the matrices. So a couple of different options for you there. Let's back up one. So if you know if you're trying to create something that is going to follow your subgroup levels. Uh, then obviously you would want to put it up post fader, right? Uh, and in that situation, really, you're just going to set those levels at zero. It's just going to follow the offset or the, the levels that are set uh, in your, with your audio submasters, right? Let me get this up just so I can have a little action shot as we go here. We've <laughs> got a lot going on in the lab these days. Okay. So uh, again, if you set it post fader, you would actually want to set these levels up in the uh, in the matrix at zero, right? You're just going to give it full gain possibility there, and then it's going to follow these levels that you've set into place here, All right? So that's certainly one way to do it. And then once you get there, you know, if you needed more guitar in the matrix, you're going to go to the matrix and add more guitar group, right? If for the show you actually needed this here, it's going to be a little bit of a problem if it's post fader. But if it's up, but you just want to offset it, you can easily do it there. But if you want to want to make it really independent, then you've got to set those things at pre fade. You know, you want to set the input levels that are coming into your matrix pre fader of this, and then usually if I'm going to do that, I'll just take these levels because I can see what these levels are in decibels and just copy it up into the matrix, right? I'll just copy those levels in. So you can kind of see that there, hopefully. A little tough to see, maybe. Uh, but those, those are actual just copies of the actual levels of the subgroups in the matrix. And then once you're done that, then obviously you can make any adjustments to it there, and it's going to be stream only where that's going to be happening, or stream or record or whatever you want to do, right? So uh, you know, it, it works just sensational to be able to do that. And then, of course, you know, you can take it to the next level and add audience mics there if you want to do it. Uh, all kinds of stuff to build that stream. In, in, and in addition, you can create a second master bus uh, by uh, just, you know, duplicating your left-right bus inserts or creating specific uh, mix bus inserts for the stream, right? You could put in, you know, multiband compression, whatever you needed to do uh, to get that audio prepared for the stream. And still, you haven't done really anything differently on the input stage, you're just reallocating outputs there, right? Okay? All right. All right, so I'm going to stop there for a minute here and just ask some questions. I think I'm going to hold the monitor mixing workflows and the monitor mixing grouping thing until the next session. Uh, just let you guys chew on this a little bit, and then we'll come back for that one, because it's actually a really fun one. Uh, it's one where I'm kind of surprised that more guys haven't picked up on how to do this on their monitor show files. There's some guys out there definitely doing it, but uh, I'm surprised how many guys don't realize how simply they could be doing some of this stuff in monitors. So let's take a look at the chat again. Let's see what's happening there. <laughs> I'm sorry, Whitson. I'll, I'll get you next week, buddy. I'm sorry. We're going to just run out of time. We'll be here for another hour on the monitor one, I promise you. But I'll, I'll get it to you for next week, I promise. Uh, let's see, what kind of metering device is that? That's a Clarity M on, on the device or on the, or on the console here, yes. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying they do the offset mixes for their delay rings, etc. So, yeah. So, let's see, what, is there anything else I can show you here today before we kind of depart at our one hour time frame? I think you guys kind of get the idea here, so uh, please. Check it out. Uh, feel free to drop me a line with a question. I'll, I'll try to address it in the next lab. Uh, but that's kind of my workflows. I mean, as you can kind of see here in my world,
Nope. I'll get my act together here on this camera switcher at one point. Oh, that camera's off. There we go. Like I say, as you can kind of see in my world here, you know, my, my entire show is really mixed right here. Uh, if you can kind of see it, audio subgroup, submaster, this is the lead vocal, lead vocal effects backing vocals and effects and this is my master left right fader right here and this is the lead vocal I mean I'm sitting right here so much of the night and then when there's a solo the solo comes up keyboard feature whatever it's gonna be I, I mean I literally can mix the entire event in that set of faders right there and if I need to navigate down and get something I'll do it I mean you know here's another example of a VCA that's kind of key to the show this is a VCA that is in charge of only the audio subgroups for the guitars right so these three guys right here so if at any point I want to bring up the guitar ensemble meaning in this in this case you know Mike Tom and Scott it was literally on one fader this is all guitars no guitars right so uh, you know it just makes you makes you where you can be really really dynamic in your mixing yeah, right I want there they are there's the three subgroups that are attached to it okay Uh, this is from Vladimir. Yes, uh, can you explain, please? Is the audio master uh, the audio master is a combination of VCA and subgroup master? In my situation right here, it is not. This is the actual left-right master. But if I had a sub drive that was being driven by an aux, then this would be a VCA for me, right? I, where I, I well, I, actually, I'll take that back. I, I still probably wouldn't do it that way because. The PA and all of the matrix drives are going to be up here on my main fader. This is my PA grandmaster here. This has got all matrix outputs that go to the PA system. So my subwoofer would probably be in there, right? But more often than not, I don't drive the subs with an aux. I, I, it's usually just an extension of my left-right bus. So, Do I change VCA assignments on a per snapshot basis? Typically, no. Typically, no. And, you know, you have to be careful doing that, right? You have to be aware of how VCAs work because let, let's take this for example. Uh, let's use this as the example here. It's a nice, easy one. If I wanted to take this VCA that is in charge of these three subgroups, right, and reassign it during the show, I have to make sure that it's at unity when I reassign it, right? If I have it sitting down here, well, now the actual subgroup levels are down here. If I reassign this VCA to something else now, these are going to jump back up. They're going to skip back up because they're not in con being controlled by this VCA now, right? So be careful with that. You know, if you want to work in and out of Unity, assigning things to and from it, to and to and fro from it, you can. But I mean, I tell you, the only time I think I would ever get caught doing that kind of thing is if I had a, a very small amount of VCAs on my console that I I only had maybe I only had six or eight VCAs. Then yeah, I might consider doing that, but you got to do it carefully. I mean, luckily in this world, I mean, I'll put my Avid hat on here. You know, here we are sitting on a, a 48 fader console. I have 48 VCAs available to me. And in the SXL line, it doesn't matter what console you're on now, whether you're in 16 faders or 48 faders, you have 48 VCAs available to you. So they're, they're there to use, man. By all means, use them. So Let's see. Yep, the inputs. Thank you for the kudos there, David Morgan. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you for stopping by. Always great to have you in the room. There is not room for all your VCAs in the eight fader bank. How do you manage that? Well, I in are you talking about right here, Gear? Is that what you're saying? Are you asking if I can expand out of that? Because I could make this all VCAs if I wanted no, uh, to do it. Well, yes. Um, well, what I was thinking, um, do you have all those VCAs on the top all the time, and then whenever you spill, you spill to whatever. So are you uh, on the 32-channel uh, console, do you put uh, some VCAs uh, to, to the bank to the right of you now? Into So you have your eight I, VCAs there, but do you go on towards the, the right of the console? Yeah, I could, certainly. I, if, if I pulled up the big orchestra show that I had, uh, which was the basis of the article, I mean, the VCAs on that show alone were probably, 
you know, 15, 16 faders of just VCAs because there was first violin VCA, there was, there was a, you know, an entire string section VCA. You know, there was, there was a lot of offset possibility there for control and for spill. I mean, I had, you know, nearly 60 mics of orchestra there. So, you know, there was a lot of VCA control there. But it, it just expands out. Yeah, I, I think my question was mostly circled around the um, because you have the the eight uh, instrument or, or, or player VCAs, but then you have the management VCAs like the the the, the, the main PA and the, the the subs and and all that stuff. Well, right. you have the main PA up there, yeah, of course. Yeah. Like for instance, if I wanted to see those main PA VAs, or VCAs or that main PA matrixes, I would just go to that VCA and spill it, right? So. Uh, so I can find it here. <laughs> but where would that main PA VCA live during the show? It Probably. actually lives here yeah, during lives the show. There. Yeah, you're cheating. And you have a bigger mixer than me. <laughs> it's there for the whole show. But well, I'll, I'll say this: if I was on a smaller mixer and I was doing this process, that would be on the top layer at all times. I would bank safe that into place. I would probably never lose sight of that. You know. I mean, maybe once I get it set, I might be willing to let go of it. I, I won't say never, never there. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Because you know, I, I even I caught myself during the show at times as well, just taking that master VCA and man, I mean, half three quarters of a dB, and all of a sudden the PA just feels better for a given song. You know, I, especially if you go to a ballad or something like that. If it's if it's time to rock, you know, instead of trying to push push more level out to get the rock to happen to feed the rock, just turn the PA up. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it worked great. Yeah. It just worked absolutely great. Thank you. Right on. Let's, uh, I'm just going to check the thing here for any more. Vladimir, I hope I got your question answered there. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Uh, Vladimir, Vladimir, I'm going to give you one more chance there, buddy. If you want, just retype your question in because it looks like you kind of corrected yourself in the question. Just go ahead and type it back in. I'll try to get to it. We got our friend Joel coming in. He's going to get right, get in right on the end of the meeting here. Oh. All right. Well, I'm going to let it go with that. Guys, thank you for tuning in. I'll try to get the audio to sound a little better next time. I'm, I've been working on it a little bit every week, trying to get things to sound better going across the old interwebs. Uh, but thanks for tuning in today. Watch for the recording. I'll send you the uh, uh, I'll send you the email with the link to the recordings and all that stuff. Go up on YouTube if you need to rewatch or anything. Get out there and use this stuff. Try it out. I, I say get out there and use this stuff. Where are we going to go? We can't do anything right now. So, you know, use it at home. Get into virtual sound check at home and keep practicing. All right? We'll see you guys. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert.